Hi, my name is Heather Rawlings and I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And I am, uh, well, I'm the Partners for Fish and Wildlife Coordinator for the office and I'll explain what that means. Um, we're located in Alpena, we're a fisheries office and most of the folks in our office are fishery biologists. That's how I got my start. Um, and I got really interested in habitat and uh, habitat restoration and it led into a different position at the office and I started a program at the office called the Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program which at that time was a really like a fledgling program uh, throughout the nation but was growing in popularity and now it's uh, the program's 35 years old. I've been doing this for about 25 years um, and my title is Fish and Wildlife Biologist. I will share my screen right here. So just if you, let's keep this really casual because there aren't many of us on. Uh, if you have a question, just feel free to ask me. Um, I do have a time limit. I do need to leave at three uh, to pick up my son off the bus. So um, as most of you know, the federal government, we've been working from home for the past two years. There is some light at the end of the tunnel. Finally, it sounds like our mask requirements are finally being alleviated at the office, which is super exciting for me uh, to be able to see people's faces again. And we might actually be back in person. They've lifted the mandate. They only had 25% of us at the office at one time. And now they're allowing, I'm not, they're, they're really unclear, but they're allowing some, you know, some more of us to be in there so I can see some of my coworkers that I haven't seen in quite some time. And so that'll be, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> um, but today I wanted to talk a little bit about my program and about, well, I know you have a theme going with, with uh, the Association of Lifelong Learners, looking at, you know, like at climate change and some things that you can do and um, you know to, to help out the climate, help out your local area, your local community. I know you're a very, giving group, you give a lot of time and effort. Um, I know I've been involved with your group for years in terms of like the, some of your master gardeners and doing some, some garden projects, that type of thing. But there are a lot more aspects to my program that I really wanted to get uh, out there. I have given a presentation, this may be the third time in my career I've given a presentation to you regarding this program. Um, so if you, uh, but this program evolves just like any, anything, just as, as we have a change in political parties and conservation as a whole changes, they have different fads and different, you know, different things that get funded at different times. Um, so I'll start with a little bit about the program and then kind of go into what, what we can do, like what we can do locally here. So this is, the Partners Program is, a, it's a nationwide program. It's a federal program. It's located in all 50 states, um, Puerto Rico, Guam, you know, all they're all over the place. Um, in Michigan, we've designated some focus areas. That just means we try to keep the majority of our projects within those focus areas, and they're all chosen for different reasons. Obviously, we choose the coastal zones because when you look at where the endangered species are located in Michigan and where our most sensitive species are located, most of them are right on the coast. Uh, in Northern Michigan, the Sheboygan River watershed is highlighted because that is, uh, in my opinion, the most quality cold water system that we have in Northern Michigan. People can dispute the Asable or the Manistee, but um, that particular system provides a huge network of, of really uh, wonderful cold water streams and a, a variety of different um, species to fish from and has the only watershed, the upper black watershed that is focused on restoring habitat primarily for the brook trout. The other, all the other watersheds have brown trout, uh, steelhead, you know, non-natives in their watersheds and they promote the, um, you know, habitat for them as well. I, but the black water is, uh, the black river is one that I've been focusing on most of my career. So um, we have biologists. Uh, I'm the only one in Northern Michigan out of the Alpena office. We have Michelle Vanderhaar down in the Shiawassee National Wildlife Refuge in Saginaw. 
And we have our state coordinator and uh, a couple of other coordinators located in our Lansing office in East Lansing. And they co-locate with like our endangered species folks and some law enforcement folks and some other, other regional employees. It's a pretty big office. Uh, we do not have a coordinator in the UP and that is, that's on my list. Uh, I've done some work in the Eastern UP. I try to get up there, but it's, it's a challenge because, you know, it's, it's a time commitment and usually an overnight stay. So, so one thing that I, I heard um, just in, in speaking with folks and preparing for this, this meeting is that this, this feeling of like we all have it, this feeling of frustration of, of with what the pandemic has, has offered us. It's kept us pretty, pretty closed up. Um, and it's been very difficult to move ahead. At least maybe it's been my experience. It's been really difficult to move ahead with some larger planning efforts within community sites. And I have to keep telling myself this constantly is that we only have control over our, our own actions. So to put that back into a land perspective, we only have control over the property that we own directly or a property that we're invested in, in terms of if we have a hunt camp or something like that. So um, it, working in large groups has been very challenging with, with, the, with COVID and with all the um, restrictions we've had. So I find that focusing on things that I can do makes me a much more positive person than the things I can't. And, uh, and it gives me a much greater you know, sense of accomplishment to do something, obviously, on your own property. And I, I'm here to tell you this program can help you. It can help you on your property. It can help make a change on your individual property. So what does this program do as a whole? It is a program that focuses with, on private landowners, on you, and improving your property for wildlife, for fish and wildlife. We work in river systems, river systems, wetlands, uh, native grass restoration. We work with some endangered species and endangered species habitat. Um, it is a voluntary program, strictly voluntary. I do not go out and hunt people down and say, hey, you have this on your property. You want to do something to make this better? I've never had to do that. Uh, people come to me. It's a cost share program. And we have a 50-50 cost share. When we're doing something that is a little pricier on properties, um, in fact, actually when I'm doing anything, I try to use what's called in-kind services from the landowner to balance out the actual funds that I put into the project. So, you know, if you as a landowner can prep a site or provide a tiller to get it, to get it tilled up or buy the mulch for it, um, I can match that with actual with plants or with, you know, whatever, whatever the project entails so that I try to make it so that there's, there's very little out of pocket for the private landowner. Um, all we ask, pardon me, all we ask in return is a 10 year commitment by the landowner. And this is a really simple federal program out of all of the federal programs out there. This has the absolute fewest strings attached it is, um, I actually have a lot of fun with this program because it's, I get to do a lot of different things. I get to see some gorgeous properties um, and there's just, there's just so much to do and so many different facets of it. I also partner with other agencies. If there's, if there's something my program can't provide, usually I know who can provide it or if it can be provided, you know, by another group. And so we really work together hand in hand with other organizations to try to get things done and to try to reach the goals you have for your property. So river restoration work, this was a really fun project and it's been over 10 years since I've done it, but uh, this was a fun project, the river restoration project. This was an old hatchery on the Boardman River, just um, downstream from Brown Bridge uh, Dam area. It's now a former flooding. Uh, and this was an old hatchery and it had filled in with muck and sediment and we're like, the landowner was unhappy with it and didn't know what to do with it. And there was a lot of concern about water warming too much and then getting passed into the Boardman River, where it was kind of a, um, it was still a cold water system at that point. So you don't want to add more warm water during the summer into a cold water system to warm 
to warm temperatures to, could be to, you know, to lethal temperatures. So what we did is we were able to take all these ponds. There were uh, 14 ponds there and we dug, we dug them all out and connected them. And this water is really fed by groundwater. So it's actually very cold water that comes in here and eventually flows out into the Boardman River, but by creating some depth in this and putting a, an agri drain up here where you can control whether the water flows in or out, we can keep water from flowing out during the hot summer months and keep that water flow for like high water times, like spring and late fall when we're getting the rains. Uh, this was a really, it was a really fun project. So we were able to create deep water habitat, shallow water habitat. A lot of it was shallow water had underwater islands, we had all kinds of perch, uh, we, we got some trees in there for perches for ducks and for turtles and for all kinds of critters. We planted, what you don't see in this picture is we planted all native vegetation around the edges, controlled all invasive species, and now this site is really a pretty incredible place to visit. Um, wetland restoration, the bottom left, that was a farm field, fallow farm field that we had water that was going through a little valley. Um, it wasn't a stream, it was just like a drainage. We blocked it off and flooded it and it's an open water habitat for mallards, uh, for uh, mallard nesting for uh, geese, um, some shorebirds, all kinds of critters use this area. And then native grasslands, bottom right. Uh, for our grassland birds, which we've lost our grassland habitat in Michigan, we only have 1% of it remaining. And there used to be just a tremendous, uh, uh, there was a lot more out there, particularly along with the dunal areas. So I focused grassland habitat restoration on the west side of the state, northwest corners along the coastline there. Um, and then the early successional forest habitat. I've been working with uh, Canada Creek Ranch is primarily, primarily the landowner that I have a few up between like Sheboygan and Presque Hill counties that own some big chunks of land. And what we do in there is we mow down like tag alder and um, as, like aspen that's a little too mature, stuff that's too mature along the riparian corridor of uh, creeks. And what we do is we put, we cut areas in hundred foot strips to encourage woodcock and grouse habitat. Then we come back in five years and we, so we stagger the strips we cut a strip and then we leave two strips. Then we cut a strip and leave two strips. Five years later, we come back and cut another site. And then five years after that, we come back and cut the remaining site. So that way you have a variety of aged habitats within 300 feet of each other so that a woodcock or a grouse doesn't have to, they could spend their entire life in these areas. They don't have to travel far for the variety of habitats they'll need in each of their life stages. So those are, those are just some of the things the partners program can do uh, I've worked with. So, but in any type of habitat or green space, there are some things that you can certainly do on your property. And the first thing is to eliminate invasive species. Everybody has invasive species on their property uh, or most people do, unless, unless you are really, really um, on top of it or unless your, your property hasn't been disturbed too much, but Really, if you have a road anymore or driveway, you probably have some spotted knapweed growing, growing on your property, which is an invasive plant. Um, probably maybe some autumn olive on your property. There are all kinds of invasive species that they spread quickly by birds. They're berry, if it's a uh, berry tree, the birds spread the berries and uh, plant a lot more for us. We know how fast they can spread. I'm sure you've had presentations on this and you know with what's going on in Michigan, there's there's hundreds, hundreds, if not thousands of invasive species that have invaded Michigan in a variety of different ways. So I, learning to identify them is the hardest part and then keep an eye out for them. But we can certainly, uh, you know, get a presentation to you folks if you're interested. If you haven't had a presentation on this, let me know. I'll get you uh, some, some good information about that because it's, it's pretty important stuff. When you're planting species, I know I'm preaching to the choir because there are many of you who are master gardeners, but I'm big on planting native species, native species only, or species. Some species are just pretty and fun to have. I get that. Um, or at least plant species that won't spread or become invasive. 
and knowing that difference is sometimes can be difficult. Um, but ask your master gardeners, you've got great sources there that can help. Uh, when planting any species, consider benefits to wildlife. You're looking for species like trees and shrubs that are mast producing. So ones that produce fruits, nuts, and berries. You're looking for plants that have various blooming times throughout the growing year. So you have are providing food for not only your pollinators, your birds, your insects, your all the critters that you know that make the world go round on your property. Having that variety in there really helps them out and keeps them on your property. So if you enjoy viewing them, which most people do, uh, you can keep them there. And then consider consider events that would threaten success of whatever you're planting. So now is not the time to plant ash trees. The uh, emerald ash borer has wiped out every ash in Northern Michigan. Uh, some are still around. I actually am finding some more. They tend to, um, the where they've been hit before, you see regrowth, but they get a certain size and then the, the borer gets them again. I've seen some mature trees that have survived when they're, when they're isolated and they haven't, um, and I, I really hope uh, those will continue to to spread their seed, and we will hopefully have some uh, some borer resistant trees that take over. Um, so there are all kinds of diseases. There's oak wilt. Uh, there's the hemlock woody adalgid. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, birch bark disease. Our poor trees are really taking a hit. There are all kinds of diseases that are spread all over the place now. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at species you wanna plant. Um, protect and encourage sensitive species. One thing we have on the coast, a lot of folks don't have are some really sensitive species. We have, we have stuff that aren't found really in any other part of the world. Um, in Presqu'ile alone, we have the dwarf lake iris, which is federally endangered. We have pitcher's thistle, um, federally threatened. We have the ram's head orchid, which in my opinion, should be federally endangered, but it's it's a little tiny orchid that um, it only grows in northern Michigan and in northern Maine. We have it in Presqu'ile. We have all kinds of gorgeous, very rare wildflowers that uh, come up in droves around here. So I feel like we're really we're really lucky to have that, and it's a pretty special place to live. Um, but as a whole, the coastline of the Great Lakes holds a lot of these very sensitive species. So we can encourage them and protect them in some manner. Um, and then you know, you've been talking a lot about climate change. And one thing that the foresters are now pushing is to say, when you are planting, if you're planting trees on your property, you may wanna pick some species from uh, the, the hardiness zone just south of us and like in southern Michigan. Um, so things like tulip poplars, red buds, sassafras, white oak. There are actually a lot of species. There's white oak and scarlet oak and there's tons of oak species you can pick from. Uh, hickory species. And then on my property I have two little rhododendrons that are growing. And these trees aren't going to take off right now. That's not the point they're going to suffer because they are not supposed to be up here yet. It's not warm enough for them, but it is evolving to be warm enough for them. And so when it is warm enough, they'll survive. They'll struggle, but they'll, they should survive. And once it does warm, you will see them just really take off. So I wouldn't do, you know, plant everything with Southern species, but I would look I would consider it and mix it into your plantings. So what can you do as a private landowner? If you have forested property, like a lot of us do have forested property. The problem with forested property is that uh, most people don't want to cut anymore. They, don't, they just, and there are so many reasons for, there's such a huge myriad of reasons and they are, you know, entirely justified, uh, but we really have a lot of more mature forest now than we ever did in Michigan. Uh, and because people are reluctant to cut. A forest stewardship plan will help you 
through the process of looking at your forest, seeing what stage it's in, seeing what age it is, and the best things to do for that forest to keep it healthy, to keep disease out of it, and then to help you recognize like what you can do for wildlife in there. Most wildlife in Northern Michigan prefers a younger forest. So the, the species that we hunt for, our game species, all of them, all of them do better with a younger forest. Uh, with the exception, I mean, you still need some roost trees for turkey, of course, uh, some larger trees for bear denning, those types of things, um, and for uh, cavities within the trees for our, for our birds. Um, but you can, you know, you can selectively cut, you can uh, selectively cut areas to provide that mi mixture of habitat to not only keep your forest healthy, but still provide a lot of habitat for wildlife. So a lot of food for wildlife. Um, forest stewardship plans, you can contact your local conservation district or a private consultants. There are a number of good ones, very good ones around here. And they're re relatively low cost. It's all, of course, you know, determined by how much property you have, you know, what, how much they have to hike through and work through. But uh, it's just a really smart thing to do. And considering that most properties in northern Michigan are quite wooded for the most part, um, it's just the best investment you can make into your property because wildlife are going to respond to that. And that's probably the number one thing that will, you know, that will um, determine what wildlife you have in your property. So uh, those plans also help you recognize like financial benefits to the actions you take as well as biological benefits. And it'll keep you current on any threats that are coming our way in terms of disease or critters or, you know, things that, that may impact your forest. So. One thing I come in contact with a lot are farm fields that have uh, been fallow. Uh, they, used to, they used to be small farms. People couldn't make money on them anymore. They sold them or for whatever reason, they retired, whatever, and they, they allowed the fields to go fallow. And it's an opportunity that can be hard to recover from at times. So I get a lot of calls from, from landowners who have, you know, they bought a 40 acre piece, they built their house on it. It was a farm. The fields have been fallow for the past five, six years, and now they're full of invasive species and they don't know what to do about it. And it's a lot harder to take those sites, get rid of the invasive species and get them into something that is beneficial to wildlife, much more beneficial than the fallow field, but it's just, it's just a lot more cost, time, and work, you know, to get them. So if you have an active farm field on your property, please keep them active. Keep them active. Keep them, uh, keep something growing on them. Um, or some kind of a cover crop, at least on there. Like, hey, something that gets, you know, mowed once, at least once a year. And, and that prevents any establishment of invasive species. Sites that have been kept up to date like that are very, very easy and inexpensive to go in into if you wanted to put in native grasses or if you wanted to get, you know, trees growing back, whatever your goals happen to be for that property, it's gonna be a lot easier to do it if you keep putting in that small investment every year to keep something growing on that, on that property and to, uh, to outcompete uh, any of your invasives. Of course, there are, there are all kinds of things you can do if you want to keep an active field because, you know, we need food. Uh, it's good to, uh, agriculture provides a, a myriad of benefits, um, but if you can leave some edge for multi, just a multitude of wildlife uses the edges of the, the fence rows, the old fence rows of fields, uh, they've disappeared. People just mow them down, they join fields, and there's very little edge left, but they're so critical for wildlife. Of course, you can put bird boxes on the edge too to encourage bluebirds and swallows and owls and all kinds of critters will use those boxes. If it's been fallow for a number of years, 
we're going to have an uphill battle, but, um, you know, your actions can be to, to get them back into some type of a crop. If they're not too far gone, that may be not, you know, not a rough thing to do. You can just brush hog it, till it, get it planted again. Um, we can get native grasses and forbs uh, reestablished. We usually have to treat for invasive species first, which often requires about a year and a half of prep before you actually get the seed in the ground. Um, you can plant to orchards, vineyards, uh, you can put in native shrubs, trees. I mean, you know the gamut of things you can do. It's, it's, it's whatever your goals are for the property. My point is my program can help you do this. We can help you plan, go through the planning process. We can help you pick species. Um, and we can purchase a lot of these species. We can purchase the, the seed. We can help pay for you know, the spraying or whatever needs to occur on the property to get it back into shape. We can help with that. One of my favorite things to do are the native grasses in the pollinator gardens. Um, so there are two types of, um, well, there's warm season and cold season grasses. And the warm season grasses are the, the ones that, uh, cold season grasses are inexpensive. They start um, growing much earlier in the season. They're cold season, so they can come up first thing in the spring, uh, get cover on your property, and when you're preventing erosion or that type of thing, that's an important, it's important to use those species. But for wildlife benefits, nothing beats warm season grasses. And these are the ones, the tall grasses that you see uh, when you head out west or you hear about the prairies. Uh, these are the grasses that, that grew at that time. And that, they are native to, to Michigan as well. Uh, there are, are short grass species. Little blue stem is the one that we primarily use. And that one grows about at the maximum about three feet tall, uh, usually about two, two and a half feet tall. Um, and then a grass that looks very similar to it is big blue stem. And that can get up to about six feet high. That's a tall grass prairie. And the partners program, we mix about 5% of uh, an Indian grass in the, into the big blue stem uh, to create a, a variety of another food source and to, uh, to augment the, the big blue stem, it really makes an absolutely gorgeous field of grasses when you see it blooming, particularly in the fall. These turn fabulous colors and uh, you wanna you know, feast your eyes on something, go out and look at these. In the fall, as the leaves are turning, you look at these grasses, they, they turn pink and blue and green and you look, at, you look at them up close and they are just a rainbow. There's yellows and just a rainbow of colors. And what I really like about native grasses is that in the winter right now, when things are really tough and there's no food out there, these grasses stay upright the whole winter. Cold season grasses flatten out when the snow hits, but the warm season grasses stay up and erect. For animals, they provide shelter um, and they are used constantly by deer for bedding. And they're considered, um, and they're incredibly nutritious for, for livestock I and mean, people can even, you know, grow this and cut it. It's, it's, it's called cow ice cream uh, for, uh, for your cattle. It's incredibly nutritious. Uh, on the prairies, the bison liked it when it was like really dry and all dried out, but they were the ones that would come and eat this after the nutritional value had gone out of the grasses. So really like throughout its lifetime, these grasses provide food, habitat, shelter, all these components. Uh, another one is switchgrass. And I know there are, are conservation professionals that push switchgrass. I'm not as big of a fan of it. It's a lot denser than uh, the blue stem and Indian grass. People say, oh, it's great for deer. It's great for deer habitat. And I know people put feed plots in. What I don't like about switchgrass is it tends to spread. And it doesn't have the full nutritional value that the blue stem has. So it's a personal preference on my part for wildlife. I know the blue stems are going to be better. So that's what I usually recommend. Um, I've also worked with folks that say, you know, I really want to turn this field into something, but I don't want a tall grass in there. There are all kinds of low grasses you can put in too. And one of them that's especially gorgeous is purple love grass. I planted that out in a site near Vanderbilt a few years ago and it's it is 
absolutely stunning in the fall. It turns purple and it only gets about a foot high. And then it has these little tumbleweeds that come off of it to seed. And that's how it spreads its seed. So in the fall, it's like these tumbleweeds are coming over the field and it's just, it's really gorgeous stuff. Uh, let's see. There's uh, drop seed, there's prairie drop seed, which is like a smaller, shorter grass that can do more in the, um, if you have a shadier site. Um, within the grass, so we plant, we put these grasses in as a base and after the grasses are established, they, they grow in clumps. So there are always spaces in between them. So you can, you can walk out through them, you can make trails through them pretty easily. Uh, after they're established, and that takes about, I don't know, two years or so, depending on how fertile the site is, how well it takes, then we'll go in and put the wildflowers in. Some people plant the wildflowers at the same time as the grasses, but then I find that it looks great the first two years, and after that it drops off and you don't have any wildflowers anymore. So I wait put the wildflowers in so they can be really become established. And I plant both seeding and I put plugs in too, live plugs and put them in and I clump them up in groups so that they can spread their seeds. Uh, and, and it's also easier for identification purposes. So you know what's being planted in every, in every area. So um, the, the big thing with grasses is that they take maintenance and you need patience. It takes time to get them established. So, um, and that's with any of our native stuff. They need time. They need time, especially the grasses, the native grasses. They have extremely long root systems. They can go down 20 feet into the ground and they work on developing that root system first before they work on developing the upper part of them. So you don't see a ton of growth, growth the first couple of years. It doesn't look like a rich grassland like you've pictured in your imagination until it the roots are established, then it sends its energy up to the stalks and, and it grows. So that's just something to keep in mind with any native plants. And that's true with the, the, the uh, wildflowers as well. They do the same thing. Pollinator gardens, uh, the important things for these, the variety of blooming times and colors. Um, you want some with seeds, some with nectar to uh, have a wide variety of birds to come and visit your your pollinator garden site. Uh, you want to keep track of the height of the plants that are going to grow, the tallest ones back, you know, maybe against the house or in the back part of the, the garden, the short stuff up front. Um, keep in mind your sunlight levels. And again, recognize that time is needed for establishment or success for these. And my program can help with this. We can help purchase plants. Um, we can help prep soils. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll put, I'll invest a ton of time and energy into a site, especially if it's like a public site, I can do that. Um, on a private landowner system, I would probably just, I would just provide the, um, the plants themselves, but I can, I can help do that. They're not terribly expensive. For a couple hundred dollars, you can get a pretty big area planted uh, near your home, as long as you prep it properly. Wetland restoration. These are these are pretty site specific, but they this is a fantastic way to provide a water source on your property, and a, they can be pretty large sometimes. Um, and a, there's a huge wildlife response when it comes to creating a flooding area, a wetland area. These are shallow water wetlands. We're not interested in digging out a pond or a trout pond for anybody. We're not going to dig a 20 foot pond <laughs> for people to raise fish. In fact, we prefer not to have fish in these sites. They usually get there from birds. We usually have minnows in there. They come in, uh, birds will bring, bring eggs in on their feet and so you have minnows that, or they'll come in through if there's another stream or something feeding it, it'll come in. But um, traditionally on these sites, this is the bread and butter of the partners program. So traditionally we were working on agricultural farm areas where we would break a tile or plug a ditch and flood an area. We don't have a ton of agriculture in Northern Michigan. So when I'm out on sites, I'm usually on like, you know, hunt, oh, hunting property or, you know, recreational property. So I'm looking at areas that where there's a stormwater flow uh, it's, and where the soils are present to hold the water. So doing this like over by Gaylord doesn't work because Gaylord is a big sand pile. <laughs> Gaylord, Kalkaska, um, 
that um, whole center of the state grilling area, there's just a lot of sand. And typically you just can't hold water in those areas. Now, Alpena um, is a lot better, though we do have a bedrock pretty close to the surface uh, north of town. So we do have to be careful with that. But um, Alcona County, um, Sheboygan County is that we have heavier soils in those counties and they'll hold water, the clay soils to hold the water. Um, we can also work with folks on a limited basis with excavation. And I get a lot of calls about this. People are like, I have this wet area on my property and I wanna open it up and create like a variety of wetland habitats on my property. I can, I can put a little bit of money towards that if it's, if it's something that I think will be beneficial to the area as a whole. So most work in wetlands or in wet areas does require a permit from the state of Michigan, from EGLE, and I had to write this out because I never remember what it stands for, Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. It's the old DEQ, the old Michigan Department of Environmental Quality. That's who we get permits from. <laughs> and uh, so that can be a process and I can, that's where I can come in and help do that. And I even pay the permit fee because it's just, it's just easier that way. Um, it's usually a hundred dollar permit fee to get a wetland to, to, to dig or to fill in wetlands. If you don't have a lot of property, you just have a smaller area, um, consider creating an area with just some small water sources. You can put in a bird bath as long as you keep water in it and keep it clean. Um, exchange the water often in them. You can put in a little, like a, like a frog pond, koi pond. Um, I'm not terribly fond of koi. They are another invasive species, but as long as they don't escape and get out, they're pretty and they can control some of the, the algae and the vegetation within your pond. Um, providing a water source just provides a place for our wildlife to, to go to, to get a drink. And if um, you don't have a lot of water on your property, this is a great way to attract more animals to your property. So just stuff to consider, little things you can do. Uh, and then I'll, I'll end my presentation with saying that one of the challenges we have in Northern Michigan is to find native plants. They can be very hard to come by. Uh, the Otsego Conservation District in Gaylord, Michigan is our closest local Michigan genotype source. By Michigan genotype, I mean plants that were raised in Michigan, can survive in Northern Michigan and are gonna do well for you. Keeping Michigan, keeping plants that you plant Michigan genotype can be challenging and it can be a little more, it's more expensive than just grabbing from any source, but they will do better. They will, um, they will be much more successful in, in our environment. So it's just something to keep in mind. If you can get Michigan genotype plants, please do so. There is a new nursery that has opened near Traverse City. It's just Southeast of Traverse City called Bird's Foot Nursery. And a friend of mine, Garrett Noyes opened it. And he has, so if you have a, um, you know, if you're looking at planting a whole garden, I wouldn't go there for individual plants. I don't think he's open in that manner. But if you're looking for a larger order for like an entire garden, he can provide that. There is also uh, the Michigan Wildflower Farm, which is, is downstate around the Lansing area. Uh, Native Connections. I purchase a lot of grasses from them. And then Designs by Nature, who is also, they're also associated with that bird's foot nursery. They're helping Garrett get, get moving. Um, and what I really like about Designs by Nature is that he strictly has Michigan genotype plants and he has these beautiful garden packets. So if you don't know what you want to plant in your native garden, you're not familiar with native plants, he will ask you, what are your soil types? How much sun are you getting? And, and he'll help you through that process. And then for just a couple hundred dollars, he will send you an entire garden, like the plugs for your, your garden. And he maps it all out for you and everything. He makes it very, very easy to put in something that's very beautiful, that's all native, and it's gonna be successful. So I apologize. We also am working with Pied Piper Schools. 
Um, oh, the other thing Designs by Nature have, uh, the gentleman there who runs that is, his name is Vern Stevens, and he also propagates rare and threatened and endangered species. He is amazing, the stuff that he can grow. He just grabs stuff and is like, oh, nobody has ever grown out a dwarf like iris. He tried. He is successful. <laughs> he can grow dwarf like iris. He can grow pitcher's thistle. He can grow um, Michigan lilies. He can grow, there. it's just never ending the things that he comes up with. And he gathers all the seed. He travels all over Michigan and gathers seed and then brings it back to his nursery and plants it. So it's Michigan genotype stuff that's grown up here. It's really, really cool. We will also have soon from Pied Piper schools, they are starting a greenhouse to raise some native species as well. And we planted a pollinator garden on site there last fall or last, when was that? I guess it was last spring we got it in, right before school ended. So, and they will be taking seed from that garden and propagating plants in their greenhouse. So, and ask your seed sources to confirm Michigan genotype plants if you want. Just ask them and, and they'll, they'll tell you. Oh, well, we get our seed from a lot of them. And I mean, honestly, Michigan Wildflower Farm and Native Connections, I know both are like, yeah, we get our seed from Minnesota or we get it from Wisconsin or, because sometimes that's the only place to get seed for certain things. So you've been very patient with me. Um, I've got a few minutes. Uh, are there any questions? Hi, I was wondering, does Netta's nursery do anything in this line that you know of? I really, really wish they did. And I have asked Netta multiple times, please, please, will you consider a greenhouse for your native plants or still even a little corner to raise some? And she says, nope, there's no money in it. And wouldn't even like, wouldn't even consider it. Okay, well, that's good to know that maybe if the customers will go in there and say something that might help, right? It would help, it would help. And she's, you know, she's fantastic with all the stuff she grows out. I really wish, I, I really think it would be successful if it's all about promotion, right? It's all about education. And if she was there saying, you know, these are native plants, they're going to do well, they're, you know, they're perennials. <laughs> I think people would, would buy into that pretty easily, but I know yeah, she doesn't. She might have enough on her plate already. She has a tremendous amount, tremendous amount on her plate. And I think yep. that may have been what it came from weariness more than a lack of interest. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. so how about it's our other nurseries and do they just, do they know about the trees that would be better for our area in, in general, would you say? I mean, you know, like, uh, you know, I hate to say like Walmart and, you know, those places that have trees like that, I would say they probably don't know. Right. No. What really irks me about Walmart and Home Depot is they often sell invasive species. I mean, they're selling Japanese barberry at Home Depot. Um, it, just horrible, horrible stuff. And I've seen it take over, you know, parcels that are several hundred acres and it's just all Japanese, not nasty thorns. Yeah, I think we have, have had one in our yard that came from who knows where. Yeah, yep, and obviously. Well, <laughs> One yeah. of them is Rotary Island, uh, I'll tell you. And they even planted that out in front of the Fish and Wildlife Service office. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> You're kidding me. So I, I ripped them out and put in good stuff, but it's so frustrating. Like people just don't, well, don't know. They're not, they're not aware enough. Yes. No, no. And it's people are like, oh, it's a Home Depot. It's pretty colors and it's cheap. Let's plant it. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Thank you for listening. I know it's a really blustery, crazy day out there. I don't know how much I have. I don't know how much snow I have out there. It's I haven't gone out yet. Mm. It's been snowing very steadily for hours. Very informative program, Heather. Thank you. Oh, thank you.